my name is Susan Agarwal. Um, I'm a, a parent. This is my daughter here. Uh, her name uh, was Karuna, and she passed away in 2014. Um, she she does not fall under the umbrella of the conditions here, but she had an undiagnosed systemic autoimmune disease, so we don't exactly know what she had, but uh, very similar conditions to probably what you see. Um, she had all the medical technology, you name it, we went through it at some point, and she needed all the usual services, home nursing, palliative care, education, care coordination, et cetera. So about me, in addition to being a parent, I became an advocate kind of by accident um, because I had to, I had no choice. Um, and so these are just a few of the things that I do. Uh, MFTD waiver families, MFTD waiver is just a Medicaid program in Illinois here um, that I founded. And I also run a website called Kids Waivers, which is programs uh, to help kids access Medicaid. And I work with a bunch of advocacy organizations, and I also do a lot of writing for various organizations. So how my advocacy began in a PICU room. Um, basically, as I said, I started advocacy because I had to. Uh, in 2011, in here in Illinois, our Medicaid agency wanted to get rid of our uh, my daughter's Medicaid waiver, which was basically the program that paid for all of her care. Out of necessity, uh, I helped to get all the families that I knew together, and this family told that family that told that family, and we all got together. We created a Facebook group, which is now up to about 500 family members. We created a website at that time, and since then, we've worked with the media to get lots of media attention. We filed civil rights class action lawsuits to make sure our kids' needs were being met. And we worked with legisl the legislature in our state, so the state senators and state representatives, to rewrite some laws. So advocacy may seem really challenging, especially if you're caring for a child who has a lot of needs. Oftentimes, you feel alone. There's probably not too many people who are like you. You may be very isolated due to geography. Even here in Chicago, um, I felt very isolated. There just were not very many kids like mine. Of course, lack of time. Caregiving takes up a lot of time, and uh, that can be very challenging. And you just may not have a connection to groups or organizations locally or nearby or who are dealing with the same issues you're dealing with. But when people work together, then that's when things happen. And so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit more today. And I'm going to turn it over to Sue in just a second. But what we figured out is if we, as parents, worked with everybody else, physicians, hospitals, social workers, legislators, the media, the lawyers in our area, and the advocacy organizations in our area, we could do pretty amazing things. So I'm going to pass it on to her to talk a little bit about how social work can help. Can you guys hear me? Is this better? Okay. Is that going the other way? Okay. Okay. So anyway, my name is Sue Shim, and it's great to meet all of you guys. I've been so impressed as I've been here at this conference of meeting uh, so many of you. And, and as Dr. Rubin says, you guys are the experts. Um, I'm a social worker that covers the leukodystrophy clinic at Anna Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital in downtown Chicago. Um, and I'm the genetic social worker, so I help with patients and families with many different conditions. Um, NORD, National Organization for Rare Diseases, uh, designated Lurie Children's as a Rare Disease Center of Excellence just this spring, so we're excited. Um, and as you can see, there is quite a few social workers in our hospital covering inpatient, outpatient. Um, we have 70 social workers on the medical side, so you know, for the ICUs or the outpatient areas, um, all different. Um, and then there's separate social workers also in psychiatry. Um, so, you know, may, many of you might have heard of social determinants of health and joint commissions asking us to do more and more social determinants of health screenings in our outpatient and inpatient areas. Have you guys heard of this term or social determinants? Yeah? If you have, what have you heard about it? You haven't heard it? Okay. 
So, you know, and you have may have lived it. So if you look at this graph and there's many different, you know, social determinants of health um, through the World Health Organization, the CDC, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, right? So if you look, healthcare is just clinical medical care is 20%, right, of the health. Um, so, you know, we may get to um, a rare disease like gene therapy, right? And uh, SMA has a wonderful gene therapy now, right? But it's not just the clinical medical care, right? You're also looking at, you know, does, you know, is there transportation to get your loved one to the hospital, right? Um, I've had situations where a family has had to call the fire department because they live in an inaccessible, no elevator basement apartment, right? There's been um, financial resources of leukodystrophy families losing ability to pay mortgage because as the parent had to take more and more time off, um, they didn't have access to income, right? Um, and so, you know, family members, caregivers experiencing, you know, anxiety and depression. Um, so not having a ramp or accessible van, things like that. So anyway, healthcare is so encompassing and needing to support um, all the supports that to get that patient to the hospital, right, or clinic. So um, we have buckets that we help with. So in, in general, psychosocial support um, in all different ways, um, linkage to resources in the community. Um, so, you know, some of the students can use an uh, accommodations or an IEP individualized education plan or 504 medical plan that could help support them. Um, there's all different transportation resources. Um, there is um, organizations in the community that help with like, so National Organization of Rare Diseases. Um, I was telling some of the families here that, you know, they have education support. So if, to get to a disease specific conference, you could get funding uh, for the registration costs and sometimes also for like lodging and transportation to get there. Um, they have respite care dollars for help with some payments for respite care. Um, so I'd love to, you know, when I find these resources to connect patients and families, um, I don't know if you've heard of medical legal partnerships. Has anyone heard? Okay. So we work with um, legal counsel, which they, um, there's an attorney and a paralegal because even though students are supposed to and patients are supposed to get everything they need, the systems always don't always work that way, right? So they could, we could have the perfect IEP written up or 504, but the school's not giving the, the child the, the resources they need or the landlord's not cooperating, right? Um, and so we're able to tap into attorneys that could help with legal advocacy, also with guardianship you know, when the patients get to uh, the, the age needing guardianship for. So, and then, you know, Ronald McDonald House. So a lot of the genetic centers and children's hospitals have access to Ronald McDonald House while they're uh, a pediatric patient. And um, there could be situations where I could help with meals or parking. Um, and then at Lurie Children's, we have something called Almost Home. So as you're leaving the ICU and you need more respite time or you need caregiver training, we have something called Almost Home with a few different locations where a patient can transition there. So the family learns a new, um, you know, technology or support uh, before taking them home. Does anybody else have a program like that in their area? No? Okay. So yeah, and then here are some of the resources that I often help the leukodystrophy families with. Um, you know, sometimes even insurance navigation is getting more complicated, right? With new insurance programs. I know some patients are on a research protocol, everything's covered, and then now the drug gets FDA approved and it's going commercial, right? And needing help navigating, getting everything approved through their insurance. So it could be complicated, um, but um, you know, I know you guys are the experts and I, I feel um, that I could try to support the patients and families through these journeys. Um, 
And then right after this session, there's going to be a session by Dr. Parag Shaw and Angela Berger on transitions of care. And so they'll talk a lot about uh, vocational services and all the tools for transitions. So um, trauma-informed care, that's something that's being um, more and more um, in the news. Um, and I know that a lot of patients and families experience trauma, um, you know, throughout the hospitalizations and ER visits, right? Um, and so there is a interesting resource tips that I was gonna give Keely to hand out as well. But um, the National Child and Trauma Stress Network, you know, defines um, this medical trauma as psychological and physiological responses of children and families to pain, injury, serious injury, medical procedures, and invasive or frightening treatment and experiences. Um, but more and more, there are tools to support patients and families with medical trauma. Um, have you, anybody, you know, accessed any resources or had support during some of the hospitalizations or visits or? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, yeah. So I know like a lot of the leukodystrophy patients have a lot of imaging like MRIs. Um, and so that could be very scary, but I love the way that, yeah, child life can make it into, you know, uh, with distractions and tools um, can help the patient and family master the anxiety around it. And uh, there's even this whole program where you could try to make it into like a camp, you know, so you get a little postcard and, you know, welcoming you to camp and making it, you know, less, a lot less anxiety provoking. Um, and then um, I don't know if people have read this book called The Good Life, the New York Times bestseller. Um, that's by a psychiatrist and psychologist from Harvard, Dr. Robert Wallinger and Mark Schultz. Um, and so, you know, they asked that what makes life fulfilling and meaningful. And what do you think the answer is? Relationships, right? And support. So that's why it's so wonderful to be here at this conference and see so much positive support and connections. Um, and so I leave that with you and give you back to Susan. Thank you. So, so, so uh, obviously social workers are great people to help you with advocacy. Um, and so the main point here is how we can team up to become better advocates. So I kind of stumbled on this process um, over the years. And, and it's basically six steps of how to solve any problem. Um, so first you have to identify the problem. Then you have to collect stories about the problem. You do a little bit of research, collect a little data. Here we go again with partnering with others. And then identify potential solutions. So first, identify the problem. So what problems are you or your family or your child facing? And I've just listed here a few common problems that we dealt with. These may not be the same problems you're dealing with, but they're pretty common problems. Uh, Medicaid coverage, home nursing or aid, having no staff uh, for home nursing or having no aids, dealing with insurance and Medicaid or managed care, denial. I'm sure you guys have dealt with denials, you know, denials for medications, denials for therapy, denials for supplies, um, not having your care coordinated, so nobody's talking to anybody else, um, not being able to access palliative care if that's something you need, uh, obviously education issues and special education issues, and financial and funding issues tend to be big ones. Of course, there's going to be lots more possible problems, but those are just some of the most common ones. So after you figure out what problem you're going to tackle, 
then the best thing you can do is, is to collect family stories. People often don't think their story is powerful, but your story is literally what can move mountains. So you have to figure out what you're comfortable with, what your child is comfortable with, and how you can share that story to, to uh, help others see what your problem is. Family stories are really powerful, really emotionally compelling. There's an emotional impact. If you share photos and videos, that can have a profound impact. And at least in my case, parents usually want to talk about their kids. So parents are happy to share. Um, I just have a few techniques uh, when, when um, making stories. And the first one is paint the child or young adult as a person. You don't want to just list out their diseases, but what do they like? What do they love? What are their favorite colors? What are, they, uh, what are their hobbies? Um, as you were telling us, your, yours loves shoes. You know, that's a great thing to put in a family story. Give very specific examples of how the problem is affecting the child. Maybe they can't go to dance class. Maybe they can't attend school prom, whatever it is. And describe the impact on both the child and the family. Next step is research. That's another picture of my daughter there. Um, research sounds scary, but it doesn't need to be. Research can be you talking to other people you know with the same condition or other people in your community. Is this problem happening in other states or other medical systems, or is it just here in my state? Has there been any research about it in medical and other journals? And you can use Google to figure that out. Are there stories in the media, in the newspaper, or on TV in the past or in other locations that deal with this issue? And can we research this issue with the families in our area by talking to the other families who may be experiencing similar issues? Next is to collect and analyze data. Again, it sounds a little bit scary, but it doesn't have to be. I did all of this. I had no experience in any of these areas, and I still managed to figure it out. So what is the purpose of data? It's to take the family stories and show that other people or other, uh, other communities are experiencing similar things. So I just list here a few sources for data. And oftentimes, you're going to need help with this, but that's OK. And people will, uh, will help you. They will be very willing to help you. So in some cases, I've gotten data from local hospitals or local programs or local clinics, or I've even just surveyed families on my own. Uh, there are research databases. Some are easy, some are not. Um, a lot of them will assist you if you're a parent and just send them an email and say, I'm a parent and I need help. There are online data sources. These may be uh, state-based sources, uh, like your program reports or Medicaid data. I use uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation a lot. And they, they're a company based out of California, and they just have a ton of data. They just have websites full of data. So if I have a question, I often check there and see if they have any data on the issue that I'm looking at. And this last one is, is something <laughs> I do a little bit too much. It's called Freedom of Information Act request. Basically, any document that is part of a public meeting or part of a public entity. So. Anything having to do with the state government, anything having to do with state Medicaid, basically anything public, you can get. You just have to ask for it. And basically, you send them a request and say, I want this information. Please send it to me. And they have to. They're required by law to send it to you. So I've gotten all sorts of information from my state um, just by sending them these requests. So anything from the number of kids in a program, the number of kids receiving a service, I've gotten documents, I've gotten contracts, I've gotten um, forms and tools, I've gotten expense reports, all sorts of things. So, um, they shouldn't actually. They can charge you under certain circumstances, but I, in, I've never been charged. I will tell you that in my state, I've never been charged. So I ask for things electronically, and then they don't charge you. Um, now, I know my state's a little bit better at this than other states, um, but it is possible to get the information. Sometimes you have to, you might have to ask um, somebody from your, your medical legal partnership to jump in there and get it for you. Um, 
I don't know what, what state are you from? Michigan? Michigan? Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if Michigan was problematic about that. But usually if I ask for it electronically, they don't charge me. On paper, yes, they will charge me. So next step, one of the most important ones, is to partner with others. Of course, we've already talked about partnering with families, partnering with other parents. Partner with advocacy organizations like the one hosting this conference. Medical legal partnerships, we use them all the time. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Surprisingly enough, we've gotten a lot of support from businesses and unions, um, in some cases nursing agencies, in some cases durable medical equipment suppliers. They actually paid for a lobbyist for us once um, just because they thought it would help their business in the long run. So you'd be surprised who's willing to support you if you ask. Uh, similar groups in other states, uh, hospitals and me medical practicing, medical practices, of course, including social workers and others, and asking for help from legislators and other politicians who are there to help you. They may say that that is not their job, but that is their fundamental job, it is to help you as, as, because you are one of their constituents. Um, working with other parents, so the working with other parents is just, in my opinion, a wonderful thing. First off, you're connected for future advocacy, um, and you're able to build partnerships that just tend to spread because one parent knows somebody else who knows somebody else, and then you just grow this big network. Uh, parents are also able to provide support for each other. So our group here mm -hmm. in Illinois started out as primarily an advocacy organization only because we needed it. That's what we needed at the time. But we realized, wow, we can really support each other. And so now we have informal programs for mentorship. We provide daily emotional support to each other through our Facebook group. Uh, we do a ton of equipment and supply exchange. You know, this person outgrows this wheelchair. I have this. Who wants it? And so that equipment gets reused and things don't get thrown out. And sometimes people even meet up locally or um, you know, within communities or at a statewide level. Uh, and that, of course, is really great to meet other kids who are like your kid or other parents who are like you. Of course, finding other parents is not always easy. Uh, there may be very few people uh, like your, your family where you live. So here again, uh, these are some potential ways you can find other parents. You can ask a hospital, facility, or a program social worker. Yes, there are HIPAA rules, but if both families agree, then they can put, they can, uh, put you together so that you can meet each other. You can ask a case manager if you have one. That could be from any program, complex care, palliative care, even your insurance or Medicaid case manager or your Title V program case manager. Title V, I'm not gonna get into too much, but that's basically each state has a special needs program that's federally funded by Title V. And sometimes in some states, those programs can help you. Of course, advocacy organizations of all types, that could be disease-based or not. Uh, disease or condition-based groups like this one here today. Regional or local groups, which tend to be more broad uh, in terms of diagnosis, but also um, are helpful in terms of geography. And program-based groups, um, these are often, you know, for little ones, early intervention can be a great resource uh, for getting little ones together. Or Medicaid waiver groups for people who have very similar needs, you know, if they all have trachs or if they all have wheelchairs, that's sometimes a way you can get a group of people together and find similar people. So now the last step is finding solutions. So how do you find a solution for your problem? So obviously the easiest way is informally, you make a couple phone calls, you solve the problem, and that's it. Unfortunately, that doesn't work a lot of the time, but sometimes it does and it's worth a try. If that doesn't work, then the three kind of pillars of moving on to the next sphere are using the media, using your legislators, and using legal a little bit about each of those. So using the media, um, here's an example of one article we had about our program that was on the front page of the Chicago Tribune. Here, one of about five front page stories I think we've had in the Tribune over the years. 
Uh, they are willing to publish things if we're willing to give them people who will talk to them and tell their stories. So families provide the stories and the emotion. And another thing is that families then can post those on social media. And you know how things go on social media. Things go viral. Everybody spreads it to everybody else. And then people like social workers and other people from the hospital systems, they can be quoted to provide kind of the expert opinion. We all know, we all know parents are experts, but you know they like to quote somebody official with letters after their name. So those people can help back up your family stories. So some of the things that we've done, some have been very simple. Write a letter to the editor. I've had a couple of those published. Write an editorial. I was able to get one of those published, and I know several other families who wrote just simple articles about various situations, everything from bathroom policies to uh, uh, institutional care, and have been able to get those covered by major publications. You can provide a quote for an article just by sharing your opinion or what's happening with your family. And you can uh, uh, appear on air. That's something I personally hate doing. So, you know, you've got to find somebody who's okay with that. And I always tell the story, you'll remember this, of, of the family we have. We have this beautiful blonde woman who can cry on demand. And so we always ask her to do the on-air appearances because it's just really something she's great at. And it's not something I'm good at. So um, use the people you have and use their skills. Of course, there's social media. And here are just some of the things that we've used in social media. Hashtags, of course. Not as much of a thing as they once were, but they're still out there. Here's a, a little graphic that we made years ago to convince our then governor to sign a, a, a specific bill that we were working on. Um, and you can, of course, use Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, if you're really in with the you know, knowledge. I don't know how to use TikTok, but my kids do. Um, you can even do petitions. People still do petitions. They sometimes work. They sometimes don't. Twitter for, legisla Twitter for legislators. A lot of legislators are on Twitter. I personally can't stand Twitter at this point. It's a mess. But if you can deal with Twitter, that's where the legislators tend to hang out. Viral campaigns, anything on social media that you can make go viral is great. And usually if you have a picture and something compelling, that will help things go viral. All right, working with legislators. It's not that scary. I promise, it really isn't. Um, and that's a, an article about a legislator there that we worked with. So these are my tips for working with legislators. Um, first is to stay local. Focus on your local reps. Don't go to your, your senator who's in Washington, DC. They're not gonna be able to help you. But find the people who serve your family. So that would be your state senator or your state representative in most states. Some, some states have different setups, but there's going to be somebody local who's working in state government for you. That's who I find most helpful. Um, the second one is to show up in person. If you show up, they, they have to talk to you. It's just the way it is. Get to know their staffers. Um, the people uh, who work for the legislators, they're the ones who actually do all the work. So if you get to know them, you bring them cookies, you talk to them a lot, they will do things for you and they will get things done. Um, use lobbyists when you can. Lobbyists are people who are paid and experienced in, in working with legislators. Obviously, I can't afford a lobbyist. Probably no one here can afford a lobbyist. But programs have lobbyists, and corporations and businesses have lobbyists. And they will kind of lend them to you or allow you to latch on to them. So see if you can find them, if, whether it's in, through an advocacy organization, your local hospital, whatever. Uh, target the leaders on your issue. In state legislat legislator, legislatures, sorry, that's a word I just cannot say ever. Um, there are certain people who work on health care, there are certain people who work on education, and there are certain people who work in other areas. So you need to find the ones who work in the areas you're interested in. I always say work both sides of the aisle. Doesn't matter. We've gotten the support from Republicans, Democrats, Independents, and everyone in between. They tend to support issues of kids with disabilities across the aisle. So work both of the so both sides of the aisle because if you get people to cooperate, obviously it's much better. Something you can do personally from the comfort of your home is to provide feedback on bills, either with a written statement or just submitting a position statement. 
I'm not sure how this works in every state, but in my state, I can look up any bill and when it goes to a hearing, I can click that I support this bill or that I oppose this bill. And if I want, I can submit a statement saying why. That all goes in the public record. So that's an easy way to say, this is how I feel about this particular bill. And testify in hearings. The first time I did it, I was scared out of my mind, but it was really not bad. I just went, I told my story, I talked about my daughter, I talked about the problems we were having um, and the problems other families were having. And everyone was, was very moved by what I said. They agreed with the bill, they voted on it, it got passed. So testifying in hearings is something that can be a little scary, but is doable, no matter who you are. All right, free legal help. So um, if you were here earlier, you might have heard that, yes, the, 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 the group that I work with, we've sued the state about five times. Illinois is kind of unique in that half of Illinois works on legal settlements. I don't think every state is like that, but Illinois tends to have a lot of lawsuits. So um, that's kind of how we get things done here in Illinois. Obviously, you don't go this route unless you have to, but if you have to, feel free to do it. We have never paid a cent for any of the legal representation that we've used, not one cent. Um, and we've done this by working with the medical legal partnerships. There, there are these legal groups in almost every state. You can Google medical legal partnerships and find the ones in your state. Every state also has what's called a protection and advocacy organization. It's federally mandated. And that is a legal organization that helps out with any issues related to disability. So you can find the one in your state and contact them for help. Sometimes they're independent law practices. Often um, they do pro bono law cases, or sometimes it's just an area of interest that they're willing to, to do it. Um, the thing about civil rights cases is they get, if, you, if they win, they get paid all of their fees by the state. So often we found lawyers were willing to do civil rights cases because they knew they would get paid and they knew they would win. Legal aid will work with low-income families um, and we've had success with them in some cases. Sometimes they don't know specifically how to deal with healthcare or education issues, but sometimes they do. And law school clinics actually can be really helpful. Um, they can give you basic advice and sometimes they will even then pull in uh, somebody who's actually completed law school to work with them and uh, help you to file your case. And, and some of these can also be useful for education situations as well. Um, and they will help you go through the process, which you can do on your own if you need to file due process or do some other sort of education uh, legal uh, situation. So this is just kind of a general slide um, and there's a lot of different things listed here. But this is, this is my slide on, I have an individual problem. My child or my family has this individual problem. Where do I go? And so I kind of grouped them um, by category. And so if you have a medical problem or funding a problem funding medical care, where do you go? So you go to see, you might look for a Medicaid waiver, a TEFA program, early intervention, Title V, or state-based state programs. If you need legal help, again, where would you go? Like the slide, previous slide, medical legal partnerships, protection advocacy organizations, legal aid, et cetera. If you, have edu if you need education help, every state has a parent training and information center where they will provide you with free advocacy help and train you to be an advocate for special education. Um, some protection and advocacy organizations also will provide this service. If you need just general advocacy help, uh, again, some of the same similar organizations. I add on here Family Voices and Family to Family. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but they exist in every single state and it's parents who have gone through the process and who have been substantially trained helping other families to go through the same process. They can give you information on healthcare and other services. Um, and then financial help. If you need financial help, you can get financial help through uh, WIC and SNAP. Those are uh, uh, 
or those are uh, f f op options for getting food primarily. Medicaid waivers are options for getting Medicaid. Um, and then TANF or TANF is, uh, is for getting actual dollars, like an actual dollars. Um, State-based programs, and these include things like SSI or paid caregiver programs, figuring out how you can get paid for taking care of your child, which you're already doing, so you should be getting paid for it. So here's just a few easy ways that you can advocate. The, the point, point of this slide is to say nothing is too small. Every little bit of advocacy you do is meaningful and important. So one thing you could do is you could join a statewide advocacy committee. I serve on a few of these. They might be hospital-based. They might be um, something to do with Medicaid. There's lots of them uh, available. And they want parent input. They want family input. Um, and the next one is help your doctor or social worker to write a letter of support or medical necessity for your child. You're the one who knows your child. You're the one who knows that information and can help the person who is required to write the letter of support or letter of medical necessity to get everything right. Uh, you could file a position on a bill, which I talked about earlier. It's a few clicks on the computer in Illinois. Write a letter to the editor or write an op-ed. Testify at a legislative hearing. Give a presentation on your child's condition. My guess is probably everybody here has done that at some point, some sort of presentation to someone on their child. Uh, call or visit a legislator's office, or just call Medicaid and insurance and yell at them and tell them to get their act together and do what they're supposed to be doing for your child or for somebody else's child if another parent needs help. And last but not least, the most important takeaway is collaboration. Collaboration is critical. If you try to do this all on your own, it's just too hard. But if you start to collaborate with other parents, with other professionals, with other advocacy organizations, it works. And so I, I really, really encourage you to collaborate. Each type of person you collaborate with will add his or her, their unique contribution, depending on what they know and what their specialty is. Uh, you develop these symbiotic relationships where different people help each other and feed off of each other. You'll realize that a lot of people have skills and knowledge that are just absolutely amazing and, you know, it's just locked away. But if you put everybody together and put all that knowledge together, it's amazing. Obviously, it spreads out the work if you're spending a lot of time caregiving. You, you just don't have that much time. So spreading out the work between different, fam different families and different parents, that can make a huge difference. And once you get a lot of people working on the same issue, that creates critical mass, and critical mass moves people. And so that's why I say collaboration is absolutely critical. And if you have any questions, obviously I'm here to answer them now, um, but you're welcome. This is just my personal email. As, as I said, I'm just a regular parent. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions by email um, relating to anything I talk to or anything relating to advocacy. And if I don't know, I'll try to point you in the right direction. So that's all I have. And then we'll just open it up to all of you if you want to ask questions or if you have comments or whatever you'd like. Or Sue has more, yeah, sharing stories or how. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm happy to send slides out if, if people want slides. Just just let me know. Yeah, I know. I was trying to wait for her to take her pictures. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I I hear you. Yeah. So um, I'm going to be careful here because I don't want to knock social workers, especially since we have a great social worker right here. But I, I, are you working with managed care also? No, so it's straight Medicaid? Okay. Um, Medicaid social workers, and sometimes they're not social workers, that's the first thing you should know. Oftentimes they're case managers and oftentimes the requirements, I, I know this because I've looked through the ones for my state, the requirements are pitiful to become a case manager in some of these situations. There's basically no requirement. I mean, it's like high school education <laughs> and a few hours of study. So. Sometimes those people legitimately know nothing. And I have run into that too. I, we had insurance case managers. My daughter, one of her diagnoses was also cerebral palsy in addition to her main condition. Um, and they would send me lawyer websites so that I could get money for the hospital causing a birth defect in my child. You know, they would send me the most rid ridiculous things. So I, if they're not helpful, then they're not going to be helpful. And so that's the case where I'm just not going to, that's just an avenue I'm not going to go down. I'm not going to work with them unless I absolutely have to. I'm going to go over their heads. And the way I'm going to go over their heads is, um, you know, I'm going to, yeah, e even hearings, you know, you have to do each one individually. It's better if you can work together with people who are having the same problem and then get somebody to, to make us think about it. And that could be your legislator, Sometimes you have to go that route. That could be, I mean, there's a wide range of ways you could go about it. Um, I, I found tips and tricks to manipulate the, the, the Medicaid agency in my state. Like I know, I get all their documents. I get all their fee schedules. So I know exactly what they cover and what they pay and how much they pay and whether it requires a PA because I got that document. And they're still idiotic. Yeah. Yeah, I completely get you, and and I I, I have sympathy because I've been through all of these things, and I've I've yelled at many uh, an unhelpful person telling me those sorts of things, and I sometimes. So there, there's also this thing I found about state Medicaid agencies, which is hide it, deny it. So they'll hide information, and then they'll deny it as much as possible. And, and that's just what they do. And until you throw it in their face, or, or you, have, you know, have it on the front page of the newspaper, they, they, they will not listen to you. And um, there, are, there are these people in each state, um, the Medicaid, they're usually called like a, what are they called? Um, ombudsman. Have you had any luck with them? I haven't had luck with them in Illinois, but I know sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems like it, in your case, it's a real systemic problem. So I would probably get together with some other families and just try to raise a stink. That's, I mean, that's the best I can tell you. There. Well, I mean, that's where I started. We started with two families, and then that family knew one more family, and that family knew one more family, and now we're at 500. So, um, I mean, I would, I don't know, do you feel comfortable online, you know, looking at Facebook groups and that sort of thing? Is that something you feel comfortable with? Yeah. I'm not social either. I talk too much and, and you know, I, I don't, as I said, I don't like doing things in person either. Um, so I hear you on that. But that's why sometimes I feel like doing things online is more comfortable for me. Um, I mean, I would, I would just try and see 
if if you can find one more family, because I bet if you find one more family, they can find one more, and then pretty soon you'll find a few. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, yeah, I hear you on that. That tends to happen, me too. But uh, so are these like G tube syringes, that kind of thing? Yeah. 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 We're experiencing that here in Illinois too. Yeah. 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 Um, what what waiver does your child have? Or the my choice waiver? Okay. And you said you're you're per, you're it's an adult now, right? Okay. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. Been there too. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. It's. I mean, I, I'm. I, I'm. I know my presentation makes it sound really rosy, but the real, the realist. You're, you're telling me nothing I, I haven't seen here, and nothing I haven't experienced myself in my own state. And I mean, it's just, and especially with adults. Um, with kids, there are more legal protections, so I can get things done with kids a little bit easier. But once they're over 21, they lose all those protections. And then it gets really hard. It's much harder with the courts. Like under 21 with the courts, it's easy. But over 21, it's really hard. And so our what we've been trying to do is get it passed for under 21 and then get expanded over 21. Um, but it sounds like, it sounds like I, I don't. I, I'm not aware of a group for for that program. Like, what, in in Illinois, we have groups for almost every waiver. You know, there's some sort of group that works with that waiver, and so that's where all the parents who are struggling with those issues go. I'm not aware of one of those in your state for your program, though there might be one. I can try and look and see if I can find one, um, just to at least to give you some support because doing this on your own is is too hard. It's just too hard. You, you're going to need to work with some other people who are experiencing the same thing. And I guarantee you there's a lot of other people going through the exact same thing and having the same struggles. And, and that's just, that's just, I mean, it's just so, it's just so, so hard. And I mean, I once wrote an article on what's the hardest thing. It's not dealing with your child's disability. It's not dealing with their medical care. It's not dealing with the emotional things. It's not even in my case, you know, my daughter passed away. It wasn't even that. It's the fighting every day fighting with everybody. You're just nonstop fighting. And that to me is always the hardest thing. That's the hardest thing to deal with. I don't know, maybe you disagree, but that's how I personally feel about it. <laughs> Seriously, I would just go sit in my legislator's office and be like, I need this and we're not leaving until you solve my problem. And you know, maybe they'd help you, maybe they won't. I don't know. Then you go back and you sit in their office again. I know. Yeah, I know it's hard. I mean, I can't drive. I have a similar issues. So yeah, I know it's hard. <sighs> I wish I could give you better advice, but yeah, keep up the good fight and try to find other people who fight with you. Anybody else have anything? Oh, great. Yeah.
Yeah. Oh, that's so sweet. But you know, I can't I can't take full credit for that. I mean, we had great lawyers who volunteered their time for us. And so many of the parents in the group put so much time and effort into helping. So, you know, it's I do what I can because now, you know, my daughter's passed away. I have more time than probably all of you have. Um, so I do what I can, but you know, it's 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 me and a whole lot of other people. I just do my part. And everybody does their part. And I'm so glad to meet another MFT person in in person. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm really bad at that. I'm really bad at that. <laughs> but I but I mean I am being honest here. It's it's not just me. I do my part, but I I have gotten help from so many other people. So and, you know, as I said, there are things I'm good at. There's things that I'm not good at at all. So we all do what we, we can. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming.